Hey everybody, uh, my name is Aaron Lieber and thanks for tuning in and coming out. I want to first just thank uh, B&H and D Technology for having me here out here to New York to share my film and uh, talk a little bit about kind of my process becoming a filmmaker and kind of how I got to where I'm at today. Um, this past summer I released my first feature length documentary called Bethany Hamilton Unstoppable. We released in 205 theaters across the country and we're top 25, it's kind of cool experience. So. Um, but today I'm, I want to talk about uh, four kind of main subjects and after each subject um, maybe take one or two questions. So if you're online watching, feel free to write in a question and I'll try to answer it. And if I don't get to it, hopefully I can at the end. Um, but yeah, the four main subjects I kind of want to talk to you guys all about is uh, documentary filmmaking, workflow, uh, surf cinematography, which is kind of my b background, and uh, just the idea of getting started. Um, and so... Yeah, so this was my first film, Bethany Hamilton Unstoppable, and there's kind of like all these accolades and kind of cool things that ha ended up happening. But before I kind of dive too far into it, I just want to note uh, I didn't go to film school. I don't really feel like I know what I'm doing, uh, but I think you can do it too. And, um, and so on that note, um, you know, when you want to get started into a, a film like, uh, like Bethany's, you first got to like get, you know, find your subject and really... Um, get to know that person and build that trust. Um, and so before I get too far into that film, I want to play the trailer and then we'll, we'll talk more about it. The Climate Prediction Center has issued an El Nino advisory. This could be a hurricane season for the record books. A solid run of northwesterly swells will charge Hawaii. If someone tells you they're not scared out there, they're completely lying. Paddle surfing? It's all about you and all the preparation that you've done in your life to be where you are in that moment. I've heard people comment that it would be so hard with one arm. I don't want that to be my reason for not trying. You decide to go out there, you decide to take that wave, and there's implications in that. There's a ton of risk. It's literally the most beautiful wave to see in person. It's mesmerizing. I see this handsome guy. Who's this guy? I didn't know she had a relationship going. She wanted to get married. But you guys didn't even like hang out that much yet. When she said she wanted to do Jaws, I had no idea what she wanted to do. I surfed out there two or three times and the place is so scary. Yeah, I don't think she needs to do that. Oh my gosh, when you're in impact zone, you seriously think you're going to die. All of a sudden, I'm an emotional wreck. I just didn't feel ready to be a mom. Being often called shark girl, disabled, all these different names, for me, it always kind of felt like being put into this box. I couldn't just like let go of my goals and dreams. It takes a lot of determination to get that one success. Up. I mean, I never thought I'd ever see this. I mean, this is beyond. So, uh, thank you, thank you guys. <laughs> so that project obviously turned into this, or is this, you know, big 90 minute feature, but I quickly want to, you know, walk back in time a little bit, like how did I get to the point where I was able to make this big film uh, and felt confident to do it? So I, you know, I first started kind of filming and shooting my friends skateboarding and surfing and snowboarding and would make videos in high school for English class and was inspired by like a lot of surf filmmakers, Bruce Brown. Taylor Steele and like documentary filmmaker like Steve James. Um, and yeah, so that was, I just kind of started as, as a hobby and really wanted to kind of pursue it later on in life, but I wasn't sure how. Um, and when I got to college, um, my mom asked, actually suggested like, hey, Aaron, you should get an internship with a surf magazine and you know, maybe you can get your foot in the door. So I was like, oh, that's a great idea, mom, thanks. And shout out to mom. 
Uh, so I ended up getting an uh, intern at Transworld Surf Magazine, which um, kind of gave me a groundwork of under to understand a little bit how the surf industry worked and how to meet surfers and start working in, in that space. And um, my last two years in college, I made my very first surf film called The Pursuit. Um, and it released in 2008, which was, you know, maybe not the best economy for a surf film. So I was like, ah, oh, like, that's a, you know, like bad timing. And, um, but it, it gave me this, this groundwork to then eventually, a few, uh, year later, get a job with Nike, and, uh, which led to making another film, Leave a Message, um, and then which led, and which led to another film that I made called uh, Zero to 100 with Lakey Peterson. Um, and during making Lakey's film, that's when I met Bethany. And Bethany was like this incredible athlete, and she and she was that you know most people maybe knew her for the loss of her arm in a shark attack and and that sort of stuff. So I it was back in 2012 that I pitched Bethany this idea like oh you should make or we should make a you know six to eight minute short film, and um, she was like yeah, yeah cool whatever. And then a year later, Lakey's film came out and she loved it and she's like hey let's do a project together. So I was like okay cool let's do it. And um, that's kind of how Unstoppable got started. Um, but, and, and as I evolved my career, so did my equipment change. And so going into Bethany's film, I invested in a red camera and just a lot more gear to make sure that I was able to kind of get to the, to the finish line and make sure it was the best film possible. Um, but yeah, just to kind of like move back into just the, the basics of a documentary film, is uh, to me the first concept is just find your subject. Um, so, you know, what makes you excited? Um, and so for me, I always just really was excited to like travel the world and film surfing. Um, and so that's what I did. And, you know, each step of the way I, I try to find, fine tune my skills, whether that was just in the different angles I would choose or the subjects like that I got to work with, you know, would keep getting better and better from kind of young 18, 20 year old kids that were kind of trying to figure out as a pro surfer to working with Kelly Slater and, uh, Shane Dorian and Shane Beshin and all these incredible athletes. Um, and part of that is like building the trust with them and working with them and communicating and, and just like being a good person. I think those are all really important things when you find your subject to like have, be transparent and make sure you're working with them in a way that's um, honest. Um, and yeah, so kind of like what I was saying with Bethany, originally it was going to be a six to eight minute film and maybe we were going to make it a little bit longer, like 15 minute bonus thing that would be like, oh, where's she at in her life? Because she had made Soul Surfer, which a lot of people saw. Um, and four months into making the film, she got pregnant, and that's when the film really evolved and becoming uh, a much bigger project. Um, so like the next thing is like for me, like make a plan. And so when you make a plan, also realize it's going to change. Nothing ever really stays the same, especially in documentary filmmaking. You're kind of always evolving, you're always running out of money, and you're always having to <laughs> figure out the next problem to solve. And so, uh, yeah, make sure you're really passionate about your subject as well, because it's going to be a long journey to the finish line. Um, and yeah, so originally it was going to be maybe nine month project with Bethany at most. And to this, to this point now, I worked on the film for six years. Um, so. And yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. You, I know there's some people in the audience here that they're working on a project for the same length of time. And what was interesting is, so we premiered at Tribeca, and I met all these other film documentary film directors. And I would say the shortest time frame was three years, and the longest that I met so far has been ten. So I think you know, good documentaries take three to ten years to make, and you know, being passionate and consistent, and um, and again, just making a plan. But know that plan is going to change. But if you don't have some kind of groundwork laid for yourself moving forward, um, you can kind of get stuck. Um, you know, like what are the things you fear? What are the things? What are the obstacles you have to overcome? Write them down and find and find solutions. Ask for help. I'm constantly googling things and researching. And um, yeah, you, you just like there's no right or wrong way. I don't think to find the finish line. You just have to find the solutions that are working for you and. And at some level, you know, outline the budget and then go find a team. <laughs> I can screenshot those if you want later. <laughs> those are some real numbers back from the day, you know, and I don't know, I probably, I definitely spent more money than that. Um, but yeah, so, but at the same time, I, my next kind of concept is just like not to get too hung up in any one problem and to just get out and start shooting. 
Um, so many people that I speak with, kind of traveling the world, they'll get, they'll tell me, oh, like I'm not sure about this camera or maybe this hard drive or this thing or that thing, and I'm like, well, just go and start and realize that, you know, through the process of what, what, what some people may call failing, you actually uh, look at that as an opportunity to find a solution and move forward. Um, and so, yeah, just problem solve as you go. Um, and keep, uh, uh, the other thing to remember too is like keep good records of all like the money you're spending and where you're going for tax purposes. Um, you know, talent release forms. You know, if you, if you can find a lawyer that's willing to work for cheap or for free, that always helps. You know, so just like realize that it's, there's a, like a large landscape of obstacles you're gonna have to overcome, but take the baby steps. And the first one is just get out there and start shooting and make sure that the, the story you wanna tell is gonna be um, powerful and strong. Um, so like while I was making Bethany's film, I didn't pay myself. So I was shooting commercials and like making a reel for myself so I could make more commercials and make money and like kind of always juggling a lot of different projects. Uh, so I want to kind of play you guys uh, a reel that I made in 2014 just to kind of show you like Bethany's project was my main focus but it wasn't the only thing um, I was doing in order to survive making that film and kind of and also a way all these other side projects that I was doing were, was a way to kind of sharpen my tools and get better at the craft so that when I go back and shoot with Bethany I was constantly getting better and better so yeah so I'll play a little reel that I made in 2014.
<laughs> Thanks. So, yeah, so the point of showing all that, like a lot of those shots or a bunch of those shots from that piece were in um, Samsung commercial and Nike stuff and kind of just all over the place of just things that were the, my bread and butter to make money while making Bethany's film. Um, and so for four years, I took on the project just to shoot and gather as much content as I could with Bethany and keep the budget as low as I could. Um, and initially when we were raising money, Bethany's sponsor, she's a pro surfer, so her sponsors kind of kicked in some money. We ran out of that pretty quickly and we, then we did a Kickstarter, which is a great way to um, cr you know, crowdsource fund your movie. So we did that and that got us through about four years of filming. Um, and then I realized four years in, like, okay, I got this, I have all this amazing material, I need a team. Uh, to really get it across the finish line. So that's when I went out and found uh, my female lead editor, Carol Martori, and my two female producers, Penny and Jane, and Bethany's executive assistant, Becky, was involved, and an assistant editor, Dan, and her husband, Adam's all up there. So that, that was our, kind of our, our core team right there um, that, to make Unstoppable. And I think, you know, when you're making a documentary, you know, if looking at the scale of your project and understanding that whether it's just shooting it on an iPhone and you, you get that material and then you figure out how to make it dynamic later, but just making sure you get the content um, and not getting too caught up with um, you know, any one tool. It's, you know, just make sure you're there, you're present, you get it, and then build your team to figure out how to like, make it the best, most dynamic film. And remember, like shooting it is one part and then there's the sound design, the score, like all these other elements that are come in later. So as you raise money, save as much as you can for post, because that's where the magic happens. Um, yeah, if you, if you get to post and you ran out of money, you're going to wish you had more. You're going to have to raise more. So um, and, and oh, yeah, so the next subject is going to be workflow. So OK, that's kind of like a brief kind of outline of documenting filmmaking. So if anybody, I'd like to open up for like one or two questions now before I move to the next kind of subject. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, how did you, so you said you didn't go to film school. Yep. Uh, you went to university and maybe studied something else. How did you find the connects to get into Nike and Samsung in that world, not having that filmmaker background? I mean, did you just send them your reel? Did they find you? Yeah, so the question is how did I, for everyone watching online, how did I kind of transition from just a col college student to um, getting jobs and networking. So my initial kind of in was just to, it was an internship at Transworld Surf Magazine. So magazines aren't really like happening anymore or you know, kind of not. So maybe online would be good. So I mean, I just looked at it as starting at the bottom. Like I'm gonna be an intern and, and work for somebody else and figure it out, which led to um, meeting a few surfers. So I'd be like, hey, like surfers, like, like I'll, I'll come film you for free. So I just go to the beach like every morning and film them and make these little edits, uh, and just kind of practice and practice. This was like when I was you know 19, 20, um, and eventually like I met a bunch of good pro surfers and I was like, hey, like let's make a movie. And they're like, okay. So then I just like made a little deck and was like, hey, like tried to like start asking their sponsors to raise money. So eventually like I made a film to pursue. I made my first kind of like short film, like just kind of performance. And through that, I met other filmmakers that one was working at Hurley, and then he transitioned to Nike. And it was kind of just like being amongst it and in it, like someone was leaving, a, was leaving Nike, and they're like, hey, Aaron, uh, we know you're, you're good. Do you want to try out for this job? And I'm like, yeah. So I tried out, and they liked what I did, and so then I got the job. And so I just think being present and being amongst your, the field that you want to be in is super important. Um, I mean, showing up is, I would say, 90% of being successful. Um, so that was kind of how I got to the point of getting those connections. Now, the other part that I think the, the landscape of all these things keep changing because now we have social media, which I didn't have then. And so now, a lot of times, like I'll have a short film concept or just even a shot, and I'll go do it, and then I'll just put it online. And then producers will reach out to me through Vimeo or through YouTube or my, or my website, and like, hey, we want to license that clip for a Samsung commercial. Great, let's do it. So a lot of times you just go create your own content and put it out there and people will find it and license it. Um, or they'll like it and they'll go, hey, we have another idea we want you to do. So I mean, this idea, the title of my kind of speech was Never Stop Creating. And so you just got to start creating and getting content out there so that people can find it. 
Um, and yeah, and go to you know come to events like this, go to trade shows, go to you know Q and A's of films that you like. Um, I just am always studying what everybody else is doing and going, well, how can I do it my own way? Um, so yeah, I don't know if that is that answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there is there a question online or any other questions in here? Okay, is there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. Um, you, you spoke about um, how you just need to get the shot. Yeah. And um, can you talk about how it seems that a lot of people, um, earlier you said you shot on the red. Mm -hmm. um, in documentary filmmaking, what's your opinion on, I mean, it seems like all your shots are so well done. But, you know, when you said you started out, was it six years ago or, or seven yeah. years ago? Well, the cameras that exist now, Kind of go toe to toe with that. Sure. So I'm just wondering what your opinion is in the whole, you know, shooting on this camera versus this camera when you're doing this kind of work. Yeah. Does it matter? Does it affect the end result? Do um, people who would be interested in your film go, no, we're not interested because you didn't shoot your own red? Sure. So the question kind of is like, what camera should you choose and does it matter? Um, and so my kind of thoughts are is that every camera is a tool and you should know what you're shooting. And so for documentary filmmaking, in even Bethany's film, I shot like anywhere from a GoPro to a GH4 and RED. So the RED for me was my backbone for like cinematic action moments, because it's got slow motion, the resolution's really high, I can pull frame grabs. So our, post, our, our DVD poster is actually a frame grab from a video clip. So I was able to like, the, the range of what I can do with a, with a RED camera is significantly more for that reason. But for a lot of other stuff, like in and out of airports or just like fly on the wall, like a big red camera is a little clunky. So I, you know, something GH4 I can kind of like hide, or you know, my iPhone or a GoPro. Like I just need to capture some of those verite moments, and I, can, you know, the I, the red isn't always the most functional for that. So um, I just looked at every situation I was trying to document with her film as well, which tool is gonna like allow me to do it. And a few times, none of my cameras were available other than my phone. So I filmed it with a phone and it makes, you know, the quality's pretty good with your phone. So, um, but then commercial, commercial wise, um, higher, higher resolution cameras tend to be what commercial clients want. So that doesn't mean you can't get a moment on a Sony or, you know, the Canon or any other camera. And, and that's to your point and kind of what I'm saying too is like, the cameras are all so good these days that like people, I hope people just don't get caught up in the camera thing because they're all good. Just get a camera and start and then go, oh, if, if I need a different, a certain particular shot, maybe you rent a, a more expensive camera. What I also found for, to backtrack a little bit to Lakey's film is I shot that all in a GoPro 1 and a 7D and uh, Netflix licensed it, so it was on Netflix. And, um, but right towards the end, I was like, man, I kind of need to like, make this thing a little bit cooler or it's like more cinematic. So I borrowed a friend's red camera and we shot maybe like a few like opening sequences with a red and it kind of tricks your eye. So because we opened up with these like really beautiful cinematic moments then we kind of went into lo lower resolution but your eye kind of remembers the beautiful stuff. So if you're kind of mixing both like all the mediums of the cameras you'd be surprised. If I played Unstoppable for you now you wouldn't know the difference between the iPhone shot a GH4 and a red, because it's like your eye can't keep up, um, in my opinion. And but you need that baseline of like a strong, I think, a strong cinematic camera for certain moments, or at least I did. And so that was why I would pick each camera. That goes right to my question. Um, by having go to the iPhone, to the red camera, the four, all in between, in post, so it's not jarring because you sort of have the cinematic vibe from you know the wide shots and the cinematic. How is it not jarring when you're Well, so first when you're in, so the um, question would be like post-production, when you're editing, how do you go back and forth between all the resolutions of cameras? So first, like you pick your resolution. So are you editing in a 1080 timeline? Are you editing in a 4K timeline? Like pick your format. So Bethany's film was 4K 185 for the, because we were going to go to the movie theaters. Um, but yeah, so first you can just pick your format. Now, everyone, you know, wants the 4K, wants the 4K, but you don't necessarily need to do 4K because you know, not everyone's still streaming in 4K, 4K. So, you know, 1080 timeline, 4K timeline, whatever it is, pick your resolution. And then, so for me with red footage, I have, 
I now have an 8K red, but at the time it was 6K. And so you can, you can punch in on your shots, you can kind of do what you want with a red. And then we would cut to Bethany's archival footage, which was shot like on mini DV or high eight or whatever it was. And we would go back and forth and it's pretty, yeah, so the, the beautiful footage will like, uh, it's like nice. And then the footage, the older stuff's like, ah, it's not as good. But you kind of just find this pacing where you can kind of go back, you weave it together in a way that just uh, ends up marrying and, and, and it works. Because people also understand like, oh, this is an archival moment. So, it, uh, yeah, you know, and then you can use little things like uh, uh, music and, and then also um, like the color correction to kind of bring it all together so that you're emotionally flowing in and out of the stuff as well. There's a kind of a lot of layers to it. Um, but again, the, the moment that's real, that really happens, if you miss that, you can't do it over. So whether it's an iPhone or a red, like if you miss it, you miss it. There's no do-overs. Um, and so just remember to get the shot, like hit record, you know? So that's, that's always my, my thing is that like you can kind of find solutions at the end with, um, cause I know you're working on a project and you shot a lot on your iPhone. So it's like, well maybe you go and do a bunch of cool establishing shots with a red camera and some, you know, and then you kind of intertwine them all in a way where you're like, cause sometimes actually that grainier stuff to me, like the iPhone stuff or whatever, you kind of just feel like you're there cause it doesn't feel, it's not, doesn't feel, it's like, doesn't feel polished, right? And, um, and as you can see, like the vlogger world's really taken off over the last few years just because it's, it, people want to feel like they're just a part of a conversation. Um, so yeah, so yeah, my, my, my philosophy is just like, my red camera is kind of my base for commercial work and paying the bills, but then when I'm shooting a documentary, it's like whatever camera's in my hand is what I'm using at the time. Um, we'll keep going to the next subject and, and, and uh, keep chatting through. So kind of workflow. <coughs> so on the go, traveling around the world, I'm using a lot of different cameras and like we just talked about and a lot of different um, hard drives depending on where I'm going. So if I'm going to post up for a while, I may, be, I may bring a, like a bigger drive, but a lot of times I'm just small little travel drives, multiple versions of the drives so that I can have double, two, three backups at least. Because um, if a drive breaks or you know you lose it or it gets stolen, you definitely just try to put them in different places and make sure you have a couple backups. Because if the footage is gone, it's gone. Um, and so, kind of my my simple workflow is I know there's a lot of like, uh, and I, I probably need to. I, I know I need to do more of this, but uh, there's software out there where you can kind of carbon clone and do all these things. But I just kind of kept it simple. I just use my finder, drag and drop footage, and I would create um, kind of each trip that I went on with Bethany would be like, we would be in Hawaii and the date, and then I would just pick red footage, GH4, GoPro, kind of put them in different uh, folders and just keep going and keep going until I ended up having uh, 80 terabytes of footage, which was uh, a little more than I anticipated. <laughs> so, but as, as I, so it's like, again, same thing with like, when you're, when you're filmmaking, it's like, if I knew it was going to be 80 terabytes when I started, I, I probably wouldn't have started. So not to get too hung up with like where you're going to go and stay in the present. So I just would buy these smaller um, uh, G-Raid travel, the silver travel drives, and keep evolving and evolving until I finally got to the shuttles and the XLs where they're like 64 terabytes, 80 terabytes, 96 terabytes. And, you know, and we have four different backups of, all, of 80 terabytes as well. Um, cause I had three editors and we had to have edit workstations. But again, if you kind of think about the, where you're going too soon, you could kind of intimidate you and get scared. So yeah, just make sure to stay in the present of, you know, okay, all I need to do right now is make sure it's backed up once or two times, uh, two times, three times, just keep them on small drives. And then when you go to edit, you know, you can scale up to, you know, a little shuttle or whatever it may be, um, to, to keep that process going. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? I have a question online, actually. Yeah. Uh, Hayden is asking, uh, how do you guard against your content being stolen? Ooh, how do you guard against your content being stolen? Great question. Well, I, um, I think that probably has to do with maybe cloud storage. But I mean, my, my hard drives aren't online. So the only way they could be stolen would, would be if someone literally stole my backpack with all my camera gear. Um, so I always just keep, I guess I would say I'd always keep my hard drives close to me and try to keep one drive somewhere else, whether that's like my parents' house or in a lock safe or, 
you know, somewhere, somewhere separated. Um, uh, but yeah, and then cloud storage, I guess you just got to pick somebody who's got like encryption and all that sort of stuff. But even, you know, you look at like, I think Sony got hacked and people get hacked. But um, yeah, I, I, I think like you just, if you're not, all, if, you, if your drives aren't connected to the internet, I don't know how they could steal it other than like actually physically taking it. Yeah, so once you finish your project, um, like first, like you actually submit it to the copyright office. Um, and then, you know, through, you know, these different platforms, whether it's Vimeo or whatever it may be, you password protect it. And then I would change the password every, because you have to send out the link to like people to review the film, all these things. So every, you know, couple days, I would constantly change the password. And, um, but yeah, I mean, that's always a scary thing. I also think it's like, if you're not, I mean, I guess this is a weird thing to say, but if you're not like a big Disney movie, like I don't really know who's coming after me trying to steal my content. Like that's, I just, I mean, I'm barely making money doing it, so <laughs> they're gonna steal it for, I'm not sure what purpose, because uh, they're not gonna make any money off it. So, um, but then the other really important thing would just be simply watermarking your, your film. Um, so yeah, the, the link online that I would send out always had a watermark. Um, and then it's copywritten. So those are, I guess, the two ways that I would recommend protecting your work. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, usually when you get to a certain level, which I don't feel like I'm at, you'll have like a whole IT department that would kind of cover that. Um, so as like a film director, I guess I'm kind of doing all of it. But I, but um, yeah, I don't really feel like anyone's gonna like steal my project. I just wasn't too concerned about that. I mean, I, I'm more concerned like my camera's gonna break or I'm gonna lose a hard drive, you know, or something's gonna like bad like that, like a fire, you know, like some kind of hazard, then someone's gonna try to hack into my computer and steal my, my movie. But I guess it's possible, so good to, good to be on it. Any other questions? Sure. So you said you it's about 80 terabytes for your entire film. Um, so you had another 80 terabytes of, uh, like copied somewhere else, or was it 40 and 40? No, so yeah, so the film in total is about 80 terabytes and I had four copies of the film on different drives so that I'd have one bay. Uh, I didn't have the time to kind of figure out a full server system where like all my editors could edit off one server. That stuff's a little bit easier to set up now than it was when I was editing at the time. Um, so you can set up now like one set of drives and everyone edits off that, the, off that set of drive. But at the time I just didn't have it so I had uh, three different bays set up for, for different editors, and then one bay that was just offline, stored just in case something crazy happened electric, electric, with, with my house, which it kind of did actually, um, because of my I live in an old apartment. So, and I also get like I recommend like with these big systems getting like a CPU like battery pack so that like say your power goes out or something happens, your hard drives can keep running and you can safely shut them down. Um, yeah, and so yeah, that's that's that. Any other questions? Keep going. Um, cool. So shooting from land um, in surf filmmaking is probably the easiest place to start for anybody. And when I'm going to go to the beach and work with any kind of surfer, I'm always I always like to talk to them about like, well, where where are you gonna uh, where are you gonna sit? What is it gonna be a right wave or a left wave? Like, what are the conditions? And, and chat with the athlete about maybe what kind of uh, trick they want to do per se. So this shot that I'm kind of showing you right now actually took me three years to get, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Um, this is a frame grab from a video clip. Um, it was shot, I believe, 8K maybe. And um, yeah, and part of the, the, you know, I want this kid, I've been working with him since he was 10. His name's Noah Beshin, and he's now 18. And I really always wanted to get a shot where this the lighting was this way, and he would do a huge, big backside air. So some of the obstacles are like he's got to deal with other surfers, and you know these are real waves happening. So some, you know all these conditions kind of have to come together. But I had this vision for a long time to get this moment, and so yeah. So three after three years of kind of trying, uh, you know, we finally finally nailed it. And um, but that's the fun part of like you know sometimes getting out there and shooting surfing or documentary filmmaking you can have these ideas they take a lot of time but once you get them they're, they're so worth it and here's another shot from land where i wanted to get this lifestyle moment i was actually driving back from getting some food 
and the waves really big, the lighting was nice, and I could see this, the waves crashing on this rock. So I ran back to the house, got Noah, and we went down to the beach, and I was like, hey, like, walk out there. And so he walked out, and we like, just nailed this moment with the white water kind of blasting 60 feet in the air behind him. And I've tried to recreate the shot a few times, and just the way the sand was and the way the lighting is, like, I actually don't think I'll ever be able to do it over again. It was kind of a one-of-a-kind moment. So, but again, these are some of the, all these shots that I'm showing you were things that I had thought about in advance. So I got, you know, pre-scout and pre-think about a lot of the ideas that I was trying to do. And, um, and then you kind of have to wait for the moment with weather and, and lighting and all those types of things to kind of make it happen. Um, so yeah, and then this shot um, was shot back in 2013. And it was one of the first shots that I got with my RED camera. So it was like this Black Friday, huge swell. Um, and the way, when the waves get really big, uh, there, there, there's a mist along the, like when you're lower and, and other waves kind of get in the way. So I went up on the third story of a house and made sure I got up high. So this moment is John John Florence and everybody got the shot of this. Everyone got it. But my angle was kind of the most dynamic and, um, and it ended up getting the cover of a surf magazine. Um, and, and then Hurley actually bought it, like did a full buyout and it was like billboards and kind of just all over the place, all from a frame grab from a video clip because of the high resolution of the red. And so it was just pretty cool to like, you know, thinking ahead, like, okay, the waves are these conditions, like what, what kind of like moment could I potentially capture? Now, I could never predict that this would happen, but I knew that if I positioned myself in the right place, I could give myself the best opportunity to kind of capture that moment. Uh, and I actually shot this 4K, 120 frames per second. Um, and so yeah, the video clip's pretty cool. And on that note, I'm kind of like showing you guys, like this was kind of the chaos of my life back then. Uh, um, I haven't always been the most organized, to be honest. And, um, but I think that's like part of the journey of you know, becoming a better filmmaker, uh, is becoming more organized. But yeah, along the way, I just kind of would buy <laughs> these small drives. Um, and I'm now, so I'm now a G Tech ambassador, but at this time, I wasn't. I was just, I just loved the drives. Um, and the, yeah, this was kind of what my setup looked like back then. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like shooting from land. Is there any other questions before I go? I'm going to talk about shooting from the water next, which is kind of more fun. But any quick questions about shooting from land online here? Sure. Did you always have your um, camera um, protected from the mist in the water? Yeah, so that's a great question if my camera is protected from the mist. So yes and no. So like you can put things over your camera to protect from the mist, but there's just so much salt water in the air. The big thing I do with my red is, uh, like there's a fan that sucks cooler air in, and so I kind of try to put something in front of that so at least it's not taking direct salt water in. But, I mean, there's just so much salt water in the air, there's not a lot you can do, so I kind of just recommend sending your camera in to get serviced and maintained as much as possible. But, I mean, it's a losing battle when you, when you shoot at the, at, the, at the water's edge, yeah. it just the, I mean, you can, you know, if you just put your sunglasses on the beach all day and then you like wipe the front of it, you're like, oh, that's just in the air. So there's not much you can do other than trying to dampen how much gets in. And then you can get like uh, alcohol wipes and wipe your camera down, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would just do the best you can. But yeah, I mean, get insurance, camera insurance, get your camera cleaned. Um, those are super, super important. Um, okay, so shooting from the water is by far my most favorite thing to do. Um, you just in the action, you're close. Um, the shots you can get are more dynamic. So I'll play you guys a little clip of. So what's really fun about like this? Oops, not this one. Play it again. What's really fun about being in the water and shooting? Oh gosh, why don't I want to pause? is you just get to be out there and, but before I go into the shoot, like, or with the athlete, I'm always like, okay, like this shot's with the same kid, Noah, I work with him a lot, um, and okay, no, I wanna get a shot where your hand's kinda going across the wave. So he would, he and I would work together and communicate on positioning um, to make sure I could get that shot, and then I'm changing my focus to make sure that the focus is for underwater rather than above water. So there's like all these little details and the more you can kind of know what you want to shoot before you get in the water, the better. Um, and then also remembering like the conditions of like what the waves are doing, what the water's doing. You don't want to get sucked out and have to get rescued by the lifeguards, um, which has almost happened a few times. 
which it can be embarrassing. But, um, but yeah, so there's one aspect is where you just get in the water, communicate with the athlete. You're usually trying to stay within 20 to 40 feet of where the athlete is. And then if you're above water, your focus tends to be one thing. And if you're underwater, you, you focus is a little bit closer to the front of the port. Um, and yeah, and then before you go out, you always want to check, make sure everything's like locked up and all your settings are good so that once, you, once you're in the water, you can focus on just pointing the camera and nailing that shot. And then my other favorite thing to do is shoot from the back of a jet ski. So this is even more fun because you, you have like, it's kind of risky, I guess, with the big waves. I'll just play this clip real quick. But it, it, you get these like, so it'll switch to the actual shot. So you get these really dynamic motion type gimbal-ish type shots, but I'm just squeezing with my legs to hold on for dear life. And, and then using my kind of body as like a mini tripod, monopod. Um, and those shots are so fun because there's no, you, you're like, you're in the action uh, and you're moving. And, um, and so you really get to feel like what the athlete feels without, um, you know, getting hit by a giant 20 foot wave. So to me, that's like the most fun. Uh, and then the last bit is just like kind of lifestyle and cinematic moments. So this was a shot I did with Bethany in Tahiti. Um, and I just like, I always kind of feel like Bethany is like this mermaid. So I really wanted to just get this cool shot where she was kind of floating to the surface, kind of in like a poetic way, I guess. And we were actually chasing whales during this kind of moment. The whales got, a, the whales got away. So I was like, oh, let's like try this other shot. She's like, okay, cool. So I kind of try to capture some of these kind of fun, fun cinematic and artsy type stuff. And which leads me to kind of like working with your talent. And so, for me, it's always about first and foremost, like building some sort of like groundwork of a friendship and making sure that, you know, what, what are the boundaries? So I work with a lot of female athletes and so what are they comfortable with? What are they not comfortable with? And really like opening a dialogue to make sure we're communicating in a way that uh, is obviously professional, but you know, and then at the same time is making sure it's fun. Um, and then like some basic things like with athletes, like uh, I always make sure that I'm on the beach before them and I leave the beach after them. So, you know, a lot of times we, I've been on shoots where it's got, kind of getting dark and everyone's kind of bailed, but I kept staying on the beach and the, the surfer would do some crazy trick and everybody left but me and I got it. So, you know, and same thing vice versa. If you're not on the beach before they are, they could paddle out and their first wave could be their best moment. So I'm always trying to be ahead of whatever I'm shooting, whether that's, you know, just the verite of the moment or, you know, just planning ahead, being on time, um, and then and then communicating with the talent on like well what are their goals what are their wants and needs what kind of shots do they like and yeah just trying to always work with them and make sure that we're kind of moving together in a in a way that works for both of us. Um, is there any questions about working with athletes <coughs> or talent in general? Cool. Uh, the next thing is like we kind of touched on this earlier, but finding a camera. Um, I guess I'll kind of just recap it again, but. Um, First and foremost, it's like, well, what's the look you're going for? And like, what can you afford? And I just feel like so many people get caught up in, oh, I really want to shoot on this camera or that camera, and they kind of get stuck. So I just really want to encourage everybody to, you know, get what you can afford, start shooting. And if there's a certain type of moment or shot you need, maybe you rent the camera or borrow it from a friend. Um, but, you know, just get going. And I think it's the most important thing um, so that you can kind of have a groundwork to move into a final product because if you don't you're just going to get stuck in this limbo like ah. so yeah my my big thing was is always just like keep moving forward and keep shooting um and then after you find a camera you got to find a hard drive and there's a lot of different options out there these are a few that i use um the armor atd um the mobile ssd and the the shuttle you know, xl or the, the mini and these are all like great drives to kind of pick from. Now, if you're traveling a lot, you want to go small. Um, and if you can afford it, you want to go solid state. <laughs> but if you can't, you know, just start with, again, start with what you can afford and what, what makes sense for you and realize the most important thing is to have a couple backups and, and make sure it's, you stay within your budget and know that it, as you kind of keep shooting, you're gonna, you're gonna scale up, scale up. Um, and if you're shooting a lot of red footage, you're gonna need a fast computer, you're gonna need a fast drive. So, you know, just remember, you know, if you shoot like a GH4, you're not going to need as much hard drive space and you're not going to need as fast of a computer. So, um, yeah, just scale up with what you need and find what works for you. But 
don't, again, I just recommend not getting too hung up on, oh, I've got to you know, save up all this money to get this big, big drive right now. Like, just keep going with what you can afford and, and you know, find those solutions um, as you can. And, and as you're making content, put it out there so you can find support and people that will kind of get behind you and back you. And I just quickly want, I'm not like a super expert on this stuff, but the kind of like difference between like SSD and non-SSD, like HDD. And for me, like if I could afford to shoot all solid state, I definitely would just because it's a bit safer as far as like not, no moving parts and that sort of stuff. But again, price point. So if you can't afford solid state, just get what, just get the, you know, a moving drive H HDD and, and then when you can't afford it, get it. So some projects, like a commercial project, they've, they're going to give me a big budget. So I'm like, right, cool, I'll get solid states for those projects. For my own projects, maybe I can't afford it. So again, just staying within your realm. You don't need the most shiny, expensive gear to like start your project. Just get going and find a drive that's going to work for you. Um, and the, this, I love this photo just because you can kind of see like, that's my kit. It's the drive fits in my bag, my batteries, my lenses. It's all in one little backpack. I have a tripod and you know, or a water housing, and so, like, <clears throat> you don't need this giant crew. Like I, you know, you can you can be a one man band for a lot of what you need, and finding the the gear that all fits in that small little bag with you and can go anywhere is super um, important. Um, and then yeah, so again, start shooting. I just I like this shot as well um, because you can kind of see like, oh, like I don't have all this gear. It's just me and a camera, um, and I'm running up a hill behind this behind Noah, but. Uh, the resolution's high, so I can use like warp stabilizer and some of these other tricks in, in post production to kind of make the shot look like I had all this gear that I really didn't have. Um, so there's and there's so many creative solutions to these problems, and people have made hundreds of tutorials online, and I'm constantly trying to teach myself and go learn the tricks that everybody else is doing. So and then like even come up with my own. Um, and so I, while making Unstoppable and a lot of other projects. Uh, Red Digital Cinema put on this competition um, back in 2015, and so I made a project called The Wild that I want to play for you guys, and it ended up um, uh, really kind of like jumpstarting my career even before Unstoppable happened, as far as getting more commercial work and fine-tuning my skills for like cinematic type staged-ish type moments. So yeah, so I'll play that for you guys now.
There's like four more minutes, but it's kind of just surf action. So I kind of want to, we've been talking for a while, so I want to kind of go over the last like bit of problem solving. And um, it's obviously an opportunity each time to like look for creative solutions. But is there any more, is there any questions on like pre-production, production, post, distribution, um, that online or you guys here that would want to ask? <laughs> yeah, those are real sharks. Those are real sharks, yep. How do you defend against that? They don't bite you? No, so those are reef sharks. And yeah, I mean, the it's funny because when you get in the water with sharks, you don't, there's no Jaws soundtrack. So, um, and, and <laughs> you know, it's not like dun, 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 dun. You know, you're just like, but yeah, sharks are curious. Um, they're kind of, in a weird way, kind of like dogs. So when you get in the water, you can see they're, they're like, they're curious or like checking you out. Um, but naturally there's a hierarchy in the water, so the higher you are in the water, the more dominant you are. So when you get in the water, they're usually at the surface, but as soon as you get in the water, they go lower and they just, they, they like give you that hierarchy straight to you. So, yeah, I mean, I usually go with professional, like, like people that swim with sharks for a living, and so, yeah, I don't know, no cage, it's all good. Um, but then if you go with bigger sharks like great whites or some of those, you maybe you probably would want a cage. I haven't done that just yet. So those are kind of smaller reef sharks like Galapagos and they're pretty pretty harmless. I guess they could still bite you, but I haven't been bitten yet, so <laughs> <laughs> what, I, I shot that it was for I shot that was a piece called uh, The Wild okay. that I shot for a competition for red digital cinema. Okay, so I shot it all in red with uh, uh, I was shooting with Canon lenses. Okay. Yep. So like 60 and 35, 100, 400, and uh, probably 24 to 105. So no cinema lenses. No cinema lenses. No. I just kind of got some cinema lenses recently, but yeah, all DSLR. So yeah, you can do a lot. Yeah. What's nice about the DSLRs is they're they're light. Yeah. You know, and you, just that run and gun style. I mean, the hardest part with DSLR for video is just the shallow focus. You barely nudge it. You're like ah, yeah. it goes out of focus. So I think like. You know, figuring out that and learning learning um, how to figure that part out is kind of a little tricky, but I mean, I love the run and gun of just DSLR for sure. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. That was stunning. I, um, it's, a, it's nice to have you here because, like I said, I've been working on a documentary for a while, and you just remind me that I'm normal. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all this information. So, um, my question is, is kind of broad, but it deals with pre production, production, and post production, and that is, what do you think was your, um, what was the hardest thing or your biggest challenge in the entire six year process? What is the thing you could go back and tell yourself, this is what you should prepare for and this is you know, what you should look up, what you should be um, ready for? For me, it would just be, just know that it's gonna take a long time, that doesn't mean that your project's gonna be you know, not as good because it's taking so long, but I'd like to know for you, what is the thing that you, would you say, you know, get enough hard drives or Sure. So what's the hardest thing, I guess, is your overall question. But like, I mean, so I would say like the four topics that are four ideas, you know, pre-production, production, post, distribution. Like to me, they're like four different marathons that you're running. And each one is going to have its own thing. And, and so for me, it's just finding what's the truth to me that's making me so excited to make this film. And just internalizing that, like, okay, I'm making it because it's gonna. This film means this to me, or it's gonna mean this to other people, or this is what it represents. So first and foremost, like, as you hit those obstacles, like, find your grounding of like why you're doing it, um, and then you know, I would say like, um, the things that would, I mean, I don't know, the hardest. Every every one was something was difficult, like. So during the shooting of it, for for the pre-production, like raising money, that was like. I mean, raising money is just not an easy, period, right? And then, like, during the shooting of it, I was doing everything by myself. I never had an assistant. And then for certain job, for certain, like, moments when Bethany surfs at uh, Jaws, I ended up having five of my friends film a helicopter, we, like, water safety, like, this huge kind of production for that moment. Um, but I kind of just looked, at, I kind of just tried to always stay present. Like, like I could see the future, okay, I'm, I'm going to need to do these things down the road, but... I don't look too far ahead because if I did, then I would kind of overwhelm myself and panic. So I was always just like, okay, what can I do today 
and constantly like making plans and then that you know when I would have maybe that trip happened and I accomplished that I just you know move on to the next thing constantly constantly like um, just communicating with talent and figuring out how I can stay in the moment um, and then with uh, I guess the other part of your question is like the I guess the big the biggest thing too would be like whatever you think it's gonna cost it's gonna be more and trying to like save as much money as you can every you know cut, like not necessarily cutting corners but like what I call like life hacking like how can I do it for less you know um, and so I think that that's a big part of it and then. Um, yeah, and then and then finding maybe you find mutually beneficial situations. So maybe you're like, oh, like I need help with this or that, and you can find maybe a company that will help sponsor it, or maybe a nonprofit or whatever it is. Like, there's just so many people willing to help, but learning how to ask and then also give back. So I mean, part of I think the cycle of being successful for myself has always been like I've asked for help. People have given it to me, and then there's a younger generation coming up, and I've been able to kind of help them as well. So trying, you know, trying to find mentorship for yourself, but also be a mentor for someone else. Even though, like, I feel like no one really knows what they're doing; everyone's kind of just figuring it out. But, but just you know, staying again, staying present. Like, okay, I got to solve these problems, and then you're gonna hit this big roadblock. Like for me, I had 80 terabytes of footage, and I'd edited all these projects before, but I'm like, I am not equipped to do Bethany's film alone. So I went out and found a female editor because I felt like that would make the most sense for a female lead. And I found female producers, and so I built this team. And I was like, okay, whew, figured out I feel feel strong, you know. And so then, but then you get into it, the weeds of the editing and the filmmaking. You're like, oh wow, that I thought we could edit this movie in six months, and it took a year. Um, and so every step of the way, there was these different problems. And, and, and then, you know, so, sound design, I got really lucky. So Dolby, had, Dolby Digital, or Dolby, had licensed, um, licensed that last project I just showed you, The Wild. And so I was able to, after four months of asking them, I got them to sponsor the film. Um, and so then they came in and did like a really, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollar sound mix. And so I'm just constantly like trying to find partnerships and find resources and, create value for myself or for the film and then also give value like well if someone's gonna help you like what what's the value you're giving them and so trying to just get creative constantly and yeah there's just so many ways to do it and find the finish line and so yeah never give up on on your dream and and you know like I said like and even if you don't even know the solution like you'd be surprised how accessible people are like I probably should be careful saying this but like I pretty much reply to everybody who direct messages me on Instagram so um, you know, like I've actually direct messaged a few other filmmakers, and sometimes they get back to me, sometimes they don't. So, but you know, just there's there's resources, there's so many out there, and so just get creative with, with the with the end goal, and then um, I would get. I think the other part too is like with distribution, just your final project is. Um, it's such a competitive space as well. So just like thinking ahead towards the finish line. Okay, like well, who's my audience? Where can this go? You know, and, and try, you know, again, staying present, see the future, but stay present because you can't. the The market changes, everything changes, but what won't change is you, what you're passionate about and your story. And that was the other thing that people come from the outside were like, "Oh, Aaron, like you got to finish Bethany's film faster for this reason or for that reason." And I was like, "No, I'm. It's the film's gonna finish at the pace that it's gonna finish, and realize that the film, some of these films, kind of have their own identity." And at some level, Bethany's film, like, I was along for the ride. Like, I started the idea, and then, and then the idea kind of went, and I was just kind of on, and then I was kind of on the journey with it, and the finish line kind of presented itself at some level. Um, so, yeah, so realize that your film will kind of kind of snowball to a point where you're like, okay, like, you're on the journey with it now. And it's kind of semi in control, even though, like, you're in control, but you kind of just have to, like, let a story evolve or, Maybe you 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 run out of money, so you got to take a few weeks off and figure out the next solution. So, being patient, um, I think, is a really really important tool in the kit of finding the finish line. You have a question? Yeah. When I went to the restaurant, no worries. We talked about it. So now you hired three editors. Yeah. To help you get through it. And you're also sitting. Were you all sitting together? And how did you um, distribute responsibilities? Or did someone do this this first year? Did someone do red camera? How did you distribute? Yeah. 80 terabytes. Just so, how would you, how, how did you do that? 
Yeah, so how do you work with an editorial team? Uh, so first I had Carol as my lead editor. So her and I would discuss like the goals of each scene or the, the you know, and, and, and actually the whole film. So first and foremost, Carol and I mapped out a three act structure and we mapped out Bethany's entire story on paper first. So we had a strategy and plan of like what we needed to accomplish. And then she started tackling a certain portion of the film and we would delegate scenes to these other editors. And as they would work on the scene, say we would all work maybe half a day and we'd have lunch and after lunch we'd all watch the scenes and talk about well, what, what, what's going on in that scene, why do we like that, why, what, what's not working. All four of us would sit together and watch each each computer is different. Like there's, th and I even was editing at times as well on my own fourth bay. But um, yeah, we would sit and we would just sit and go over that scene, and and then they would go back to work. And then maybe they, you know, a couple hours later they felt comfortable to like reshare a scene. And so then we would all sit together and we would communicate. Well, what what's working? What's not working? And we just did that. Pro I mean, every scene in Unstoppable was probably edited and re-edited at least a hundred times, if not more. Um, yeah, because it's what so so you're kind of like piecing together a 90 minute film. So it, it you know you're editing all these things and you put it together. And you're like, well, actually, if we move this scene here, you know. So we kind of edited Bethany's film linearly, and then we we re like that's kind of like a little boring. So then we decided to like bookend things and look and mess with the structure a little bit to make it flow more. So it's kind of like a feeling process. There isn't necessarily a right way to do it. It's just like we would just find, and then ultimately, like Carol went through the entire film once we got to a certain point and she would touch, as a lead editor, she went through everything and made sure the pacing was the way she wanted it paced. Can I just real quick? Sure. So every, each scene was done and then you put it on one big timeline, and then, so then when, so when you put it on one big timeline and then you started you know, changing the puzzle pieces of each scene, as you change the puzzle pieces, Yeah, yeah. Keep going. We keep going. It's like an endless, it's like an endless rabbit hole. It's kind, kind. You make one switch, then the ripple effect causes you to. Sure. So yeah. So we would. So all this, like, let's say, from a, like, this wasn't exactly how it worked, but like, let's say Carol's working on Act One, and this our other editor Ramel is working on, let's say, Act Two, and let's say Dan is working on Act Three. So eventually, all three acts kind of come together with all the scenes within those acts onto one timeline, um, but like the, the structure of like the inciting incident or like the middle, like the middle, like the structure doesn't change, so you're just trying to, so you, you maybe you adjust a scene, but it doesn't necessarily ripple through the whole movie because like it's more like you're tightening things up. Like at one point we had a two hour cut and we, we went to Red Studios and played it on their, at their theater and to get feedback from editors and people who weren't involved. And, and so through that feedback, then we took that two hours and we pushed it down to 90 minutes. And then as we went through that 90 minutes, it's cr you can go, okay, I like, I'm liking the scene, but how can we make it move quicker? Well, sometimes, like, it sounds weird, but we just go and shave off two frames. You can shave off two frames from, you know, 90 seconds, and all of a sudden it's not 90 seconds anymore. I don't know that math off the top of my head, but you know what I mean. It's like you can kind of go, okay, instead of 90 seconds, it's going to be 60 now just by shaving off a few frames. But you still have to pay attention to the pacing of it, and 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 sometimes, especially with documentary, you tend most people tend to be overwordy. So you're like, the concept and idea gets repeated a lot in a scene or through like ten minutes. So you're like, oh well, as soon as we say it, it's like say it versus see it. So you're kind of trying to like, as you edit these scenes, like, did we say that too many times, and did you see it, and how can we like? do as little as possible in a way to like execute the emotion and feeling that we we're trying to go for with what was happening in her life or whatever the film is you're, you're trying to accomplish. So yeah, it, it's a feeling process for sure. And you'd be surprised though when you get everybody in a room working together, like how succinct everyone starts to get with like the style and the pacing and because you start to, everyone kind of like feeds off of each other a little bit. But you definitely want one lead editor, okay, it's their, they're kind of in control of like that ultimate final pacing. Um, and everyone else is there to facilitate. Like, I think the other big problem with just or issue is just getting through the material. So we, you know we had 500 hours of archive, plus the 80 terabytes that I shot. So it's just like get, making sure you're kind of you have a team in place to find those moments. And my assistant editor Dan and I, we actually mapped out four hours of 
like what I would call like kind of like a paper cut of just like these kind of concepts. So I, my, between myself and Dan, we knew all the material that was out there. So if my, say my, my lead editor was like, oh, I'm trying to build this scene, I need this kind of content, we go, okay, boom, here's a timeline of like all the potential stuff you could use to help facilitate this scene. So just knowing your material really inside and out is super important, which is just time consuming. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Is that how you would, so you would time code it and then clean up and take all that out and then hand that to the other editors that need it? Yeah, so for, so how, I guess, how do I, the question is like how do you work with your editor on like what you like and don't like? And so with Bethany's film, because she's a pro surfer, one thing I would do on my own was I would go through all the surf action footage and I'd pick all my favorite moments. So I, I left all the material there for her so she could see it all, but then I would like say, you know, on a timeline you've got multiple levels, I would put my favorite moments on like level two or level, like maybe level two is like my second favorite moment and level three is like my favorite moment. So I'd kind of give her a vision of what I was going for and then we had all these interviews, interviews. and so a really important tool is like transcribing. So there's a website rev.com you can transcribe all your interviews and use, and use that to like build a baseline of, of like okay the, this interview goes with this and it's really it can kind of get really complicated and that's why having a lead editor who really has a vision for taking all your like I've got thousands of these ideas so I kind of like unload those ideas and she helps me kind of work through that material and work through the ideas and kind of make it into a cohesive story it's rev.com rev.com yeah rev.com they're like, there's a few others, but it's really inexpensive, and they're super fast, and it's so, because I and, and think about it, if you have six years of content, you're the you're gonna get you're like where do I even start? So if you transcribe all your interviews and you can and you read them, you go and you can start highlighting. Okay, like this sound, this is gonna be good. This is gonna be good. And you can start putting things together. And as you guys know, like someone talks for for an hour, maybe you might have to like kind of make a sentence because they stumble like right now if I like Bleh, you know you can kind of cut that out and put it together so the more you can kind of do things in a simple format like I, I would just do like three by five cards and we'd have a three-act structure and we'd put them on the wall like opening scene like Bethany becomes a mom we would we kind of like just did three by five cards and then we did you know a paper cut of the film through all the interviews and yeah so it's just like a constant process, and that's where I think the, the the secret is having a lead editor who can who can help you take your vision to the to the finish line. Because those are for documentary filmmaking. Yeah, that's what you really really invest your money into as a good lead editor. Yeah. Where did you shoot um, the majority of this footage? So a lot of stuff I've been shooting is in, mostly in Hawaii, but then some of it was in Indonesia, Fiji. Um, Costa Rica, Mal you Maldives. With the talent to those locations just to get the waves? Correct. Yeah, so I travel with the talent, whether it's a commercial job or um, a competition. So a lot of the pro servers are like Bethany would compete at like Lower Trestles, or she competed at Fiji. So I kind of like ta I would tag along and um, capture her doing that. And like Bethany ended up getting third place in a Fiji event, and she's like breastfeeding her new boy and beating world champ surfers and. I'm kind of a fly on the wall kind of documenting all that. So yeah, you just kind of, I've been fortunate to kind of get into a specific industry like surfing. But I think that's like, maybe I didn't mention it earlier, but I think that's such a great backbone for anything is like just getting out there action wise, whether it's like skating or surfing or snowboarding or some kind of like, you know, something where you can kind of just get out and work with, with talent and try to figure out like, I've, I've made hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of just short videos that kind of like, gave me the groundwork to then make a bigger film. Um, and so, yeah, the more practice and you can do with small projects, the easier it'll be when you get to the bigger one. Um, and, and again, like, and I'm constantly like listening to podcasts and just like researching things because it, you know, there's, the, the more I learn, the more I understand like there's so much more to learn, right? It never really ends. And so, yeah, but again, not getting too hung up on that and just like have fun with it and keep pushing yourself, yeah. Yeah. One of my biggest concerns on subjects. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so working with Bethany on the post-production and editing. So yeah, so when we had, we had about 20 minutes of the film edited and that was like the, then we showed her. And um, yeah, I wasn't, I feel like I knew her so well that I, for the most part, wasn't too worried. But then every, as we kind of dove deeper into the filmmaking process, I would send her a new cut or a scene every probably a week or two and would get feedback because I just felt the more she saw these different scenes and could, it would be more authentic. Like, yeah, that's really what happened. That's how I felt during that time, whatever it was going on. So yeah, I was kind of always in communication with her through the entire editing process. Um, not all talent will give you that much of their time. So you have to kind of work with their ability and schedule. And then sometimes like talent also may not know the process of filmmaking. So you have to be a little careful Maybe like, oh, I shouldn't show them this just yet because they don't understand like there's gonna be sound design later and all these other things that are gonna change how it feels. But Bethany's been involved in her own production of content for her whole life. So I felt comfortable sharing with her and communicating. Um, oh yeah, and, and conflict, yeah. I mean, there was, there was definitely times when Bethany and I didn't agree on something. So you have to, um, you know, I, there was a point where I didn't sleep for, you know, two days. but. Through that, I found a creative solution. We, we kind of cut it, and, and then she liked that solution, so we were able to move forward. So for sure, with any project, you're gonna have conflict with your characters, and, but I mean, there's duality, so you can be like, oh, like, darn it, like, I don't like what their opinion is, but, or you can go, actually, man, maybe I can get creative and still have my vision and their vision and find a new way, and every time that conflict happened, I actually think the film got better, so it's, the conflict, you gotta kinda lean into the conflict in that I think it's gonna, it ends up making your film better. Um, but when you're a creative, like the last thing you wanna hear is like criticism, right? You just like wanna, but the criticism, it's like, that would be, the, that would be actually, I'll say that I kinda built an, a, a group of friends that I will take criticism from, like my parents being one of them, um, and some other pro surfers, and, and just friends who are like kinda into film but know what I'm trying to do. And like, oh, this is what I'm trying to do, and I play it for them. And if they don't get it, then I'm like, well, why don't you get it? And I have to like suck it up and listen, you know? So you have to like be willing to take criticism and willing to like listen to what works and is not working, and then and use that as like fuel to like make your project better. Uh, like, I think the more most nerve-wracking thing for me was playing in front of 40 people in a movie theater without final sound and all those things. Cause we had to cut out two or we had to cut out 30 minutes of the film to get it to 90. So we were like the whole time, like just cringing. Cause we're like, you know, cause it's not mixed perfect and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, you, you just have to get over it though because the only way your film is going to be good is by showing a few people that you feel like are going to give you good constructive criticism uh, and be willing to take it. And yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the fact that anybody will watch it and give you their time is so valuable. So, yeah, it, it, but it's painful, for sure. <laughs> Getting feedback is never fun. Especially when you're trying to, like, you have your vision, like, this is perfect. It's never perfect. <laughs> never will be. Um, yeah, so I guess well, I want to play one last video for you guys. So I recently shot this with G-Tech, um, and it's just a fun kind of, like, way to maybe slightly to end and also sh share a little more of kind of my fuel and vision and yeah so I'll just play you guys this last video. I see a vision in my mind and I want to capture it. It's my passion for storytelling that draws me into every imaginable situation. I'll go beyond my comfort zone and immerse myself in the landscape, the characters, the motion. To capture and secure a flash of action requires impeccable reliability and support. And G Technologies Armor ATP All Terrain Drive is what I use to store these singular events. I am forever seeking to bring a picture from my imagination to life. The thrill and satisfaction of capturing these moments is why I'll never stop creating.
there, is there any last questions online or any last questions you guys have? Yeah. Um, I, I noticed you had it up there. I think I kind of cut you off. I'm sorry. No worries. Distribution. Yeah. Um, how early did you start planning that? Um, one of the things that makes me a little nervous is as I've been sort of researching for the stuff that I do, pitching to like Amazon or Netflix or maybe even Disney or who knows. Sure. Um, it seems like they have very stringent um, guidelines where they want you to shoot with these cameras and these parameters. Um, so when it came time for you to distribute your film, how early or how much did you in regards to distribution and where it would all go. And, and if you could also talk about the process of um, entering your film in the, in the festival circuit sure. and how that, uh, how that, what role that plays into distribution as well. Yeah, so I, um, oops, I'm gonna go play, let's put something on. Um, I'll go back to that slide. Um, so distribution wise, uh, I would say the market's changing a lot. So I'll say now that I feel like the Netflixes of the world, Amazon, Sony, whatever, they want to get involved earlier than later um, and sink their teeth into the projects that they're interested in. So yeah, if you can kind of get on their radar and maybe get them signed on sooner than later, that's great. Um, there's a few different documentary sales agents that you can reach out to that can help navigate some of that stuff. In Here in New York, there's Submarine, um, who was the sales rep for me, uh, Unstoppable. Um, so yeah, I think like that first and foremost. Now, I'm not sure about the guidelines you're talking about of cameras. That may be more for feature films, but like you look at documentaries, they're shot on all sorts of cameras these days. So, and a lot of it's archival. So you, I mean, I think m maybe it'll be more like, oh, we want this resolution or, you know, that or format type thing. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, 4K content, all that stuff's like, you know, really valid. But if you have a good story that, has amazing archive, um, you know, it, they're gonna still probably want it if it's a good story, so. Um, but yeah, the sooner you can get on their radar, I would say the better. Um, what was your other questions? Um, it was kind of a lot packed in there. Oh, yeah. So then, yeah, so then festivals, so. Um, so there's, it's interesting because I'm like still working with some friends and it's like, Finish your film, then enter festivals. There's so many people, and including myself, where it was like, we're entering Sundance, and we're like working towards this deadline, and having a deadline is really important to actually finish a project. Um, but I wouldn't get too caught up with like, oh, it's gotta be in this year's Tribeca Festival, or whatever, just like make sure your film is like, because once it's done, it's done. You're not going, you're never going back. So be present with just making the best film pos possible, and then, if you have sales agents and those types of things, they can kind of help you try to present your film in the best format to the festival. But ultimately, you just go on, you know, Film Freeway or um, directly to the to the place and, and enter and and realize that I think in the top three festivals in the United States, Tribeca, South by, and Sundance, like over thirty thousand films submit and only one percent get in. So it's really challenging. And so, but that doesn't mean your film's not awesome. There's just so many politics of like. This year, the festival wants to do this genre of like type, of, like the the market's always changing, and so um, yeah, your film your film can find its way to its audience. You just gotta be hungry for it, and you know it's competitive. So, um, but yeah, if you have a little teaser or something you can show Netflix or Amazon to get them on board early, the easier all that other stuff will be for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I I had never been you know in a major festival so we premiered at Tribeca and like that was such a fun experience and then you know but that didn't mean we were like getting distribution so we if we finally it took it took like eight months to like negotiate or to find distribution and then negotiate and get through all the contracts and all that stuff so the film finished we released it in, or uh, premiered it in April of 2018 and we didn't come out until July of 2019 so it was like over a year and three months before we released from finishing it so yeah it took eight months to negotiate contracts and it took a few months to um, to get a deal and yeah it's just there's a lot of content it's really competitive but like my journey is not going to be your journey right so everyone's like there's gonna be some films that are just like a hot topic and they'll get picked up real quick and you know so there's just a lot of different reasons why things happen and move and I'm I'm read I'm just started reading a book called The Alchemist I don't know if anyone's heard of it but I just started reading it, yeah. I'm not a big reader. 
But like the, the prologue, he just talks about how like you know his 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 audience didn't get found for a, a long time. You know, it took him a while. So just be patient and persistent and stay positive. And yeah, the sooner you can reach out to those people, the better. But they may not understand it. Maybe they go, yeah, that sounds cool, but we're not. You know, don't take no for an answer. You know what I mean? Like the just because they say no once doesn't mean you can't go back in six months or three months or whatever and present a, the same idea but from a different angle because maybe you're maybe it evolved probably did at that point so um yeah just stay hungry and passionate and smile have fun <laughs> anything else any other questions where are you from man? i'm california oh, you so, said that, yeah. yeah yeah so i'm out california yep so i'm out here for a week and fly on tomorrow well, thank you guys so much. This has been fun. Thanks.